Bonjour. Hello, everyone. My name is Neha Agarwal. I'm a dev manager at Microsoft. I work in Azure Container Networking, network security policies, and observability for Azure Kubernetes services. And along with that, I'm also actively involved in an ongoing discussion for a CAP for multi-network in a SIG multi-network group. And with me. Hello, everyone. My name is Ardalan Kangarlu. I'm a distinguished engineer at NetApp. I've been involved with the Kubernetes community, and I've built software based on Kubernetes since 2016. So today, we are going to talk about how we have implemented network isolation in a shared multi-tenant cluster. So before we start, let's quickly go through the agenda. We are going to talk about the basic principles of Kubernetes multi-tenancy. What are the existing scenarios that exist today that solve some of the crucial network multi-tenancy scenarios? How we have enhanced those scenarios and added network isolation on a shared multi-tenant cluster? And last but not at all the least, we have a very promising demo followed by question and answers. So with that, I give the floor to Arlen to start. Thanks, Nahal. So as Mel mentioned, there are different definitions for multi-tenancy based on the context. For the purpose of this talk, we're going to define multi-tenancy as running multiple instances of the same application or different applications with some level of isolation on shared infrastructure. There are two main reasons for doing that. One is reduced cost by consolidating many applications on fewer VMs and clusters. We can reduce costs. There are fewer um, you know, VMs to manage less cluster management fees that all hyperscalers charge. Um, and the second reason is scale, because now there are a larger pool of resources available to any given application, so the potential for uh, scale is much higher. Now, as Mohan mentioned, there are two main considerations here. One is security, the fact that applications from different tenants sometimes, um, or, um, you know, they don't know each other, or they can be adversarial in our applications that can run on the same um, infrastructure, can run. And the second problem is that applications can adversely affect each other's performance, commonly known as the noisy neighbor problem. Now, as far as state of multi-tenancy in Kubernetes, there are different implementations within Kubernetes and outside of Kubernetes. As far as compute, Linux namespaces and C groups are common ways to isolate processes running on the same host. If you want even higher isolation, you can run sandbox pods. Examples of them are Cata containers, GVisor, and Hyper-V um, that provide kernel level isolation, just like virtual machines. As far as storage, there are some objects that are namespaced, some that are not, plus um, different storage protocols like um, NFS, SMB, um, or different storage platforms. They have different ways of restricting access to volumes and files. As far as networking, that's the main focus of this talk, so we covered that uh, quite extensively later. And in Kubernetes um, namespaces, these are the common constructs to separate different tenants, and using service accounts and RBACs are common ways to control access to the Kubernetes objects. Now, the classic example of multi-tenancy is Coke and Pepsi running on the same shared infrastructure. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to use the hypothetical example of the red soda company and blue soda company running on the same um, cluster. And I'm going to reference an application that I wrote called SodaDB. You can get it from GitHub to illustrate these concepts. So the three uh, main ways to provide network multi-tenancy in Kubernetes are pod networking, network policy, and service mesh. And these technologies are different in the scope of isolation that they provide. For example, pod networking provides isolation within a single Kubernetes node. Network policy uh, is associated with um, providing um, separation for pods that are running on the same cluster. And then these technologies are different at, at different layers of the stack. For example, network policies correspond to transport layer and the network layer, port numbers and IP addresses. Now, um, just a quick recap of how Kubernetes networking is implemented. In Kubernetes, we have a flat network namespace model. That means any pod can talk to any other pod or a node or the API server using its IP address. Now, here's an example of two SOTA DB pods that are running on the same node. Um, despite both of these processes listening to port 8080, um, they don't interfere with each other. That's because 
the underlying processes, they map to different network namespaces in Kubernetes and in uh, on the host on the Linux. And if you want to know the next level detail, these network namespaces are implemented through something called pause containers in Linux and uh, Kubernetes. So um, for each, for example, in this case, I have the red soda DB namespace. I can see its owner is a pause container. And once I enter that namespace, I can see the IP address corresponding to the red soda pod associated with this namespace. Now, network policies are ways to specify rules for uh, controlling ingress and egress for pods. This requires CNI plugin support and has been there since the early days of Kubernetes. An example of a network policy would be to allow communication between name, uh, uh, front end and back end or in a restrict communication within only red namespace or within the blue soda namespace, but not across them. Perhaps the most complete um, technology that provides network multi-tenancy Kubernetes today is service mesh. And by defining uh, uh, authentication policies and authorization policies, one can um, restrict communication between different microservices that are running on the same cluster. Um, so at NetApp, we wanted to build a storage service based on Kubernetes. And unfortunately, these technologies, they all have some gaps. For example, network namespaces and C groups, again, they help with isolation within a single Kubernetes node. Network policies help with isolation between Kubernetes pods that are running on the same cluster. In our use case, our server pods, they run on Kubernetes, but the storage clients, they can run outside on virtual machines, right? And um, with service mesh, one can have a mesh that consists of both Kubernetes pods as well as virtual machines, but that use case is only limited to gRPC applications. And for our use case, you know, we wanted to support NFS and SMB storage protocols, so that didn't work for us. So the question was really, can we do better? And in the rest of the talk, Neil is going to explain how. Oh, be before that, um, this is really the state of art as far as um, how network multi-tenancy is implemented for cloud services. So today, um, in GCP, in Azure, and in AWS, the way cloud services are built is that each um, Kubernetes or service project has a dedicated um, project. Within it, we have a single, within it, we have a Kubernetes um, cluster. And this project or subscription gets linked with the customer's um, project via VNet or VPC peering. So as you can imagine, this is very secure because there is only a direct link between customer's environment and the service. But the downside is that there is really no um, sharing. Each customer, each tenant has their own dedicated um, Kubernetes cluster within uh, the service project. So now uh, Neha is going to tell us how we can improve on this model in the next few slides. Thank you, Arlen, for covering all the great options we have. So just in the last slide, what Arlen has explained, so the hosted services, what they're doing right now, they're deploying customer applications, which requires direct connectivity to their network into their dedicated infra Kubernetes clusters. Now, what does that mean? That incurs a cost to the hosted services, which in turn will be expensive for the end customers as well. So what we really wanted to achieve is the shared Kubernetes cluster to host a multi-network, multi-tenant workloads. Now in this diagram, you can see there is a customer pod deployed on a Kubernetes cluster hosted into the hosted service tenant. It has two interfaces. One interface is the default interface. Let's call it an interface from the default network. And let's call that as an infra network. And that is routing all the traffic. Let's call that traffic as management traffic. That's routing the management traffic to the default cluster-wide network. The another NIC, which is injected, which is the ith one, the yellow NIC here, which is injected from the customer network into the pod running on a, on a multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster. So that NIC has the private access to the services running into the ser ru services running into the customer network over a private IP. All this has been done on a shared cluster, and that what that gives us it saves money to our hosted services and in turn to the customers as well without compromising security. Let's talk about the challenges what we have faced in achieving what we've what we have just discussed. 
So two main things, the kubelet. Kubelet is not aware of multi-network pods. Kubelet internally invokes CNI. For those who do not know what CNI is, CNI is a container networking interface which is invoked by the container runtime to provision the networking for the pods. So kubelet, when invokes CNI, it only is aware of a single interface. It will go and deploy, it provision the default in interface on the pod, can have multiple IPs, but they all belong to the same interface. Similarly, Cube Scheduler, it does not know about these special nodes which can satisfy the multi-network pod needs. So let's see how we are addressing the problem. So we have extended our CNI to attach these secondary interfaces onto the multi-network pods. So now here on the right side, you see there is a node which today a Kubernetes node is provisioned with a single interface, but now we have extended the node to also attach additional interfaces, which will later be provisioned uniquely for each different network. So on the, you see your two extending our lens ex, uh, example for red soda and a blue soda. We have our two necks, which a red one is for red soda neck, and then there is a blue soda neck, it's two. They both are provisioned separately into their red soda tenant and the blue soda tenant. And when a multi-network pod, the red soda pod gets deployed, now that NIC which was provisioned on the host gets projected into the pod. Now inside the pod, you are seeing two, two interfaces. One, which is carrying your management traffic onto from the default network. And the second, which is carrying the customer traffic, the rest of the traffic is going all via the second interface. Now these red soda, uh, pod and blue soda pod are running a trusted code. So they can be process isolated. And then there are the security policies we can apply to make sure that they're multi tenant But if they are untrusted, then they can be provisioned isolated via Kata, Kata Hyper-V or Gvisor. Later in the talk, we will also talk about how we have used device plugins to make this special worker nodes and these ex additional interfaces as a first class resource for this cube scheduler. Deep diving into the details of the CNI extensions. So we have leveraged the CRD based approach. So hosted services, they will deploy a CRD. Let's call it a pod network CRD. It defines what my pod customer network looks like. What's my, the VNet VPC information, the subnet I'm going to be using to inject I to provision the IPs. Then a pod event, the customer pod gets deployed. It is labeled with that CRD. And then referencing that CRD gives a signal to CNI to do the extra work. And not star is we have, we will be aligning with an ongoing cap, uh, which is, which is ongoing cap for the multi-network. So extending onto it, this ith one, which is provision into the customer network. So the R cloud, which is hosting the core networking services provisions injects this NIC into into the customer network. But let me deep dive into what's happening inside the guest, inside the VM by the CNI. So when the multi-network pod gets scheduled, Kubelet invokes the CNI. CNI learns this information from the Kube API about that this pod is labeled with the pod network CRD. So it requires an additional NIC. It also gets the information from the Kube API that which of the available interface on the node is associated with this NIC. Eventually, CNI moves that NIC, projects that NIC into the pod. And now my pod has two NICs, it's zero and it's one. A lit, going a little deep dive into the blue soda pod, what you see inside, you will see two NICs. One is your infra NIC, and then another is your management, and another is your customer NIC. And then there are additional routes which are provisioned, where like management traffic, like a pod traffic or, DN, or service traffic, all traffic will go via it's zero and all your rest of the traffic will go via it one. Going a little deep further, how our CRDs will look like. So we have defined a pod net on the left, we have defined a pod network CRD, where we have defined the VNet and the submit constructs. And then on the right, once you label your pod with that CRD, you will have a multi-network pod. Now, uh, so now let's talk about the cube scheduler part. So how would a cube scheduler know that this is my special node which is coming up with additional NICs? Not all node in my Kubernetes NIC, I want to attach multi-network pod. I want to secure my system node pools. I, uh, so 
I, there are only some node pools. We, I have additional network policies where I can host these multi-network pods. So for that, we have achieved it by using device plugins. So with the device plugin, we can, we can extend the node capability. Device plugins registers these additional interfaces as a resource and make them as a first class. So they, they learn about the available interfaces on the node, pass it that information to the cube scheduler. Now a pod comes up requesting for one of the additional NIC as a multi-network multi -network interface, and then Kubelet will pass that information to the device plugin, and device plugin will do its magic, reserve the pod, allocates, and CNI will do its magic of extending that interface into the pod. So with that, I'm gonna give the stage back to Arlen to see all of the work we've been doing into a real working demo. Thanks, Nara. So next is to show you everything we talked about is real. So in the setup, uh, we have a Azure Kubernetes service cluster, an AKS cluster that is running two instances of SodaDB application. One is corresponding to the red soda company and one is corresponding to the blue soda company. These pods, they both have two IP addresses. The ETH0, Nick, gets his IP address from the VNet and subnet associated with the AKS cluster. And then the ETH1 interfaces, they get their IP addresses from the customers, VNet, and subnets. So um, in this demo, we're going to show you that the VMs that are on the customer side in the projects and the customer subscription can only access the pod that was provisioned for that customer and nothing else. All right, so now here I have a multi-tenant Azure Kubernetes service cluster. This AKS cluster has a single node pool. And this is also a special type of node pool. They call it multi-tenant node pool because it has multiple NICs. And in this instance, we have two nodes in this node pool. So I'm gonna use one node per tenant for hosting the SodaDB pod. So the next step is for us to um, create our multi-tenant environment. So I'm going to create uh, first two namespaces, one for each tenant. So you can see here, well, there is one namespace for the red soda company, one red namespace for the blue soda company. And then I'm going to create the pod network custom resources that Neha just talked about. So there is one for the red soda company and one for the blue soda company. And if you notice, these two pod networks, they reference different VNets and subnets, one corresponding to each tenant. Next, I'm going to create the pod network instance objects. So these are optional. And then I proceed by creating my deployments. So the first deployment corresponds to the Red Soda company. And here, if you notice, there are, I'm using some special labels to associate this deployment, this pod, to the pod network that I created in the step above, right? And then I'm gonna do the same for the Blue Soda deployment. So I create a deployment for the blue soda, de soda DB deployment and I associate it with the blue pod network. And one thing to note is that both soda DB instances are listening on ETH1 interface, the IP address that was coming from the tenants environment. So I proceed by creating these YAMLs and objects. Um, and now we should have two pods running in two different namespaces for each tenant. So within a few seconds, these pods should be up and running. So if you notice, there are two IP addresses here. These IP addresses correspond to ETH0 interface coming from the Kubernetes um, subnet for AKS. Now, um, I'm gonna show you the Red Soda DB pod. Here you can see this pod is running and I'm gonna exec into it. 
and show you the two network interfaces that's within this pod. So the second interface, the ETH1 interface, that's the one that is um, connected to the customer's environment. And I'm going to use that IP address to populate some records in the SodaDB database. So in this case, I add four records, you know, Red Classic, Dyed Red, Cherry Red, and um, I'm going to do the same thing with the blue SodaDB pod. Again, this pod also has two network interfaces. And the second interface is used for connectivity to the client. So I also use this IP address to uh, populate some records. So in this instance, I'm adding only three records for the blue soda DB. Now the next step is to show you the network connectivity between different environments. So we want to confirm that the red soda DB uh, cannot talk to the blue soda DB instance. So I exit into the red soda and I use the blue soda DB's IP address and I can show you that they can't talk to each other. And I can show the same thing on the reverse path. So the blue soda cannot talk to the red soda pod. That's the winning moment. <laughs> now, in the rest of the demo, I'm going to show you the connectivity from the VMs that were provisioned in the um, customer's subscriptions. So for that, I switch over to the Azure portal. Here's the VM, Red Soda client in the customer's environment. And you can see the IP address for this VM. So now I'm going to show you this VM can actually talk to the uh, Red Soda DB instance using its um, ETH1 IP address. So you know, I use curl. I'm going to retrieve record zero. And you can see Red Classic was retrieved. Ne next, I'm going to show you that this VM cannot talk to the blue soda DB instance that is running on the same cluster. And you can see it can't because there's no route to that soda DB instance. And you know, the same thing works on the blue soda client VM. The blue soda client VM can talk to the blue soda DB instance, but it cannot talk to the red soda DB instance. One thing I want to highlight here is what Arlen is showing, that this is all connectivity is over private IP. There is no public access. There is no load balancers in front of it. There is no express route gateway. So it's all about on, on a direct private connectivity. So it's, all, it's more secure than ever. All right. So that concludes our demo. And with that said, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Hello, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you showed the scenario where the pod has each a separate uh, network interface device. Uh, so if I run five uh, pods on a single node within the same customer network, they do get five network interfaces. Am I correct? So yes, for now the implementation has, it will get five different interfaces onto the node, but that's something you can, you can extrapolate as well. So there, you could do both. You can have a single interface and that can be projected into the five customer pods pointing to the same NIC, or you can, the implementation, what we did the case study was we had a def, dedicated NIC to a dedicated multi tenant network pod. Okay. But, the one you are asking is it can be achieved. You can have a dedicated NIC for each different network and can multiplex into the pods running on the same, same node. Oh, I would probably like to have the other way around, to just have a single network interface. We do. For I mean, that's, that's our default implementation. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. And does the cap also support this? Because from, the, from what you have shown, there is some kind of limits and the number of NICs that you require per pod, if I understood correctly. So the, the implementation what we had is an influence from the cap. Uh, the cap, what cap is suggesting is to have these, the CRDs what we have created as the first class, first class spec inside the pod spec. 
So uh, as of now, I, I'm, I'm not sure if there are any limits, but I can, I can get back on that. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, one question I have is uh, the choice of uh, the network interface you want to connect is based on the labels uh, on the pod that we put, if I saw correctly. And uh, how do you stop anyone uh, to, uh, if I am the blue soda, to connect to the red soda uh, network interface just by changing my labels, if I want to? So, sorry, could you please extend the last part? How will you change? Uh, uh, if uh, I'm the Blue Soda company and I want to change my labels, and uh, let's say I want to uh, change the label pods to uh, Red Soda company, how do you uh, check that it's not possible today, uh, except with... Um, I'm just going... So, I'm going to back to the slide. So, you're saying how, if I change something in my Red Soda pod to access to the blue, I, uh, on the slide with the custom resource uh, definition, when you talk about it. Thank you. Oh, the, so the custom resource definition is, is managed by the hosted service. So the security aspect is, it's not owned by the customer itself. The hosted service platform, which is hosting this Kubernetes worker node, Kubernetes cluster, is managing the CRDs. And Arlen, you want to add how we will use, we yes. are going to secure? So basically, for example, NetApp as a service provider, we are the entity that provision these storage pods or blue soda, red soda instances, right? And we manage the network policies for them. So when a customer comes to NetApp, you know, we coordinate with them as far as, you know, what subnets they want to use for mounting their volumes, right? And we have this contract between them and we define, we as a service provider, we define the pod networks for them. So we restrict access across different tenants, but we ensure that each tenant can securely and privately access only their pods and nothing else. So this is the responsibility of the service provider to manage the pod network objects and enforce multi-tenancy. Thank you. There are two questions here on the front. And, yeah. Hi, um, I've seen multi-network interface pods in with Multus in KubeWord, is this using Multus as well? Uh, no, uh, we, have, we have extended our own Azure CNI. The reason Multus, Multus is, mo is attached to a different CRD called Network Attachment Definition. And like I said, our influence was the multi-network cap. We eventually want this pod network CRD to be the first class, uh, first class resource into the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem. And that's why we went with our own Azure CNI. What are the limitations in terms of network interface counts? I know certain SKUs in Azure can only have four network interfaces and stuff like that. What are the limits of that? So Azure today owns uh, up to eight, um, eight NICs on, on a given VM, but that's, that's an ongoing, uh, like ongoing work to extend that. Okay. Yeah, I would also add that the novel thing about this implementation is not so much the kind of multiple NICs per pod, but rather it's how these NICs are connected to hyperscaler, you know, network constructs like VPCs and VNets that are extending the customer environment. Hey, good morning. Uh, this is Ehsan from American Airlines Platform Engineering. Um, so we are not using any like network plugins when we, we are hosting like thousands of apps on our platform, but maybe in the future, if you wanted to move towards that route, um, is there any limitation on your side when it comes to logical separation or isolation of the CIDRs or ETH01 or 2? And let's say if, if I have a client and they have like a SaaS services running on my platform and even within the same namespace, they want to isolate the network for the pod security concerns. Is that possible with your network plugin? Or NIC plugin, sorry. Do you want to take that? Or? Hey, go ahead. So, yeah, so, you know, obviously different CNA plugins, they have different implementations. So, you know, there is no one silver bullet or one way of doing things. In this instance, um, as far as isolation within a host, this is done through network namespaces. And I showed you an example of that, you know, how that was set up with um, the next network namespaces. So that provides isolation within a host and many uh, CNA plugins like Calico, the ones provided by, you know, 
Azure, Google, and it all worked pretty much the same way by setting up these network namespaces. So that's isolation within a given node. And then um, as far as isolation beyond the node, there are other solutions that we talked about, you know, like um, network policies and service mesh. Any more? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, just one question about IP address management. I'm guessing the pod IPs are not stable. Do I have any chance to uh, integrate like external DNS or something via service or something to, um, to have a reliable networking connectivity? Yeah, so actually one cool thing about this implementation is that we can also have the option of having stable IP addresses per pod. And that's actually what NetApp wanted because as pods move around between nodes, their IP addresses change. And you know, for storage services, it's very important to keep the IP address persistent because you, every time it moves, you have to do a remount. So one thing we didn't show quite here is that you can actually, using the pod network instance custom resource that I didn't talk too much about, you can actually associate a fixed IP address um, to a given pod. And as the pod moves around, the IP address goes with it. So that was another thing that was quite different than other you know, CNI implementations. Yeah. Adding on to what Arlen said, great question. We do have the capability to extend and not make these additional interface IPs as ephemeral. So that means we statically bind that with the multi-network pod. Okay, I think that calls for all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.